Hey, hey, what is going on, world? This is your boy, Kwame Sarfamensa, owner and founder of Identity Talk Consultant, LLC, and your host for Identity Talk for Educators Live. And I'm here with a very good friend of mine, another phenomenal brother who I had the honor of meeting, was it a year and a half ago at, um, in Jacksonville, Florida at the yeah, Black Educators Rock Conference. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, since then, man, we've just been connected um, yeah. just through different projects, different initiatives. Um, and he, he's a doctor, y'all. He's a doctor. Let me just put that out there. Mm-hmm. Probably the most dapper doctor has a, <laughs> has a pocket square that matches every suit he got every time I see him. So, I mean, my man fresh. But let me just run down the, the resume real quick so y'all know who I'm talking about. So we have here Dr. Dario D.T. Henry. Um, and he is a proud native of Miami, Florida, correct? Yes. Miami, Florida, M-I-A, all right? And um, he did his undergraduate work at um, University of Central Florida, UCF. Yeah, and Dean College. I went to Dean College. And went to Dean. Dean College as well. Um, so he's got he's been to so many colleges, man. Got to try to <laughs> keep up. But right. um he he's got his Bachelor of Arts degree in liberal arts and sciences from UCF, a master's degree in criminal justice from Bridgewater State University yeah. here in Massachusetts. And I said he was a doctor. He's got his um EDD in higher education and administration from Johnson and Wales University. Yeah. So, I mean, the brother is just well-rounded. And then on top of that, former student athlete. They play yeah. football Yeah. during um, your UCF days, correct? I know my Dean College days. That's yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. That's so, yeah. So he's doing a lot, man, from advisory work, academic coaching. Yeah. Um, and then outside of that, when he's not doing all these phenomenal things, he got he got his own podcast, which I was honored to be a, a guest on, called yeah. the Swag Bender Podcast. So a fitting title, right. you know, me for a <laughs> dapper brother. So we're gonna talk about all those things. But let's welcome Dr. Dario D T Henry to the show. Welcome, brother, man. It's always good to rap with you. Always good to talk to you, man. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. What's up, everybody? Yes, yes. So, listen, man, we're going to get right into it. So, I know a lot about you just from our interactions, man, over the past couple years. But um, for those who don't know, Dr. Dario D.T. Henry, before you were a doctor, let's talk about your upbringing up in um, Miami. So, what was that like just early on in your life? You know, growing up, Miami was an interesting place, man. I went to... uh, you know, I was born in Avon Park, Florida, and I moved down to Miami and, uh, when I was like two. So shout out to Polk County. You know, I was about two years old when I got down to Miami, man. And, you know, I would say um, being from Miami, I went to Brentwood Elementary, man. I had a great elementary experience. All of my teachers, Mr. Morrison, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Cornfield, Ms. Fisher, everybody, you know, really uh, poured into us as as kids in that elementary school. And I... um. I had an opportunity to be involved in like some gifted programs because I was testing real high. I always say my claim to fame is uh, I was the back-to-back spelling bee champion at Brentwood Elementary. Oh, see, I never knew that. That's what's up. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, I, I had a lot of uh, opportunities as an elementary student to really, um, you know, explore different subjects and expand my mind, you know. Um, I was challenged a lot, pushed a lot. And then I grew up with a mom that was very much in the education and a father that was very much in the church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my father being a preacher, I had, I had the the, the spiritual side and then the educational side. And I credit, I credit my father with uh, helping me um, learn things outside the classroom that helped me in the classroom. And I was, I was ahead of the game in some way. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, my father, when he preached, he would ask me to rewrite um, the, the sermon outlines that he had created. Mm-hmm. Um, because my handwriting was better than his. And when I was recreating those outlines, 
you know, if you look at the little sermon books that they get, yeah, they have the Roman numerals in it for the outlines. True. So, you know, at early elementary, I knew what that was. So I'm outlining this for years and years and years. By the time I got to school and they were teaching us how to do outlines, man, I was already there. You know, I you know, years of experience doing this, um, you know, making me read the Bible to him and pronouncing words like Deuteronomy and Ezekiel, yeah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, People goodness. understand that um, th that helped me develop uh, my language skills, that helped me develop my reading skills, comprehension, interpretation. So uh, I was always a little bit more advanced in school um, because I, I credit my father for that because he was always, he always had me in a learning environment, whether it was, you know, at home with my mom or through the spiritual education that he took me through. So that was one side of my, my Miami life. And then I would say, um, growing up in Miami, man, it taught me to hustle. You know, there was so much <laughs> going on back then. And, you know, um, we'll talk about it later. I'm, I'm going to write about it in a book that I got coming out eventually. I'm um, going to talk about some of the lessons that I learned from the Miami streets. So, oh, well, yeah, that's man, good. yeah, man, like being in Miami, man, growing up, um, seeing people like Uncle Al and the Sugar Hill DJs and getting the mixtapes from the 183rd Street flea market on Sundays and seeing that kind of hustle, <laughs> you know, we grew up on, you know, I have my church side, but I also have my street side. So seeing the creation of certain music styles, like Two Live Crew and the Booty Uncle Bass. Luke. Yeah. Yeah, Uncle Luke. Yeah. Did it, did it, did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, 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 get it, get it, you know. Get it, get it. So, and, um, and, and seeing not only the creation that they, that, that they did with that, but also them uh, fighting for their right to do those types of things. So if you remember back in the day when Two Live Crew um, were up against the Supreme Court. Yep. And yeah, we lived through that. You know, a wow. lot of people said that, but I was living during that time. So uh, that really inspired me a lot. And, and, um, and then you have all kinds of things in Miami. You, know, you got the streets parts, but you got, I say this, you could go to Miami and do everything in a weekend on all sides of life. I mean, mm -hmm. you can you can go to church, you can hit the club, you can hit the sports arenas, you can, you can, you know, you can hit the stores, you can hit everything in Miami, hit all the different food spots. So, um, you know, being from there, um, I, I, I have a good uh, group of friends. It's very diverse because, you know, we have various cultures in Miami. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's why I always tell people not everybody that's Black is African American. So I think that... Uh, you know, Miami helped me uh, be open-minded, mm -hmm. um, gave me the hustle, gave me um, the grind, and uh, and let me know that you know um, that there was you don't you don't you you may not be number one, you may not be the first, but you could be next. And and yeah. I say that because we have a, a huge uh, population of NFL athletes that come out of Miami. Which yeah and, yeah. So it's hard to be the first, but it's it, you can always be next. And, um, you know, as long as you do you and stick to the script of what you can do, um, you should be all right. So Miami County, you know, gave me all of those lessons, man. So, um, um, yeah, and I appreciate it. And then, I, you know, I did expand out and move. You know, I lived in Miramar. I lived in Hollywood. Um, and that's right across County Line Road. So, you okay. know. You know, so I had had those experiences where I was able to explore myself and and um and come into who I was, you know, as DT Henry. And so, uh, so shout out to MacArthur High School. I went there, you know, and um and uh and just the whole they say South Florida is a different place, man. And I, as I've gotten older, I believe that it is. Yeah. Um, and it teaches you a lot. So I appreciate it all day. Yeah, it's crazy because um as you're talking about Miami, I'm just thinking about um. Cause I'm a, you know, being a sports fanatic, mm -hmm. how I learned about Miami is just through watching, um, cause I like to watch 30 for 30 on ESPN. So they oh, had yeah. a documentary about the U. So I for those who don't know, University of Miami, the Hurricanes. Oh, dang. Um, and fun fact, when I was growing up in Connecticut, mm -hmm. early on when I was like eight or nine years old and I was watching it. So this is around a time when um, I think Dennis Erickson was the coach. So this is after the Jimmy Johnson era. Right. I was watching college football, and Miami was my team. 
Okay, all right. <laughs> so, like, I grew up watching, like, at that time, they had, like, um, I think maybe O.J. McDuffie, mm. uh, Lamar Thomas, like, those guys. Uh, yeah, um, all right. Gino Toretta was a quarterback. Yep. So, like, that's, like, my era, like, early 90s. But it was right. interesting. Like, we talk about kind of, like, the struggles for Black folks, like, the racism and at the time in Miami, especially in the eighties at the high yeah. crack era. Like I learned mm -hmm. a lot about just the hard knock life, you know, living right. in Miami as a, as a black man, you know, and just the trials and tribulations those players had to face, you know, from the, the Michael Irvins, you know, of the world and the, yeah. uh, and all these other guys who are like, Hall of Famers or just had great careers. Like a lot of people came out of that program, but it was right. crazy what they were doing back then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always tell you that. Yeah, man. There's two, they say uh there's there's Miami South Beach and okay. then there's Miami. You know, yeah. so I grew up on the Miami side. So a lot of people don't know that, but um there are two sides to that, man. So yeah. Yeah. But um definitely love that uh, Miami vibe. Been to been fortunate to go to Miami. Um, a couple times just for like vacation so you know being from Connecticut man we listen to everybody you know we listen to Uncle yeah. Luke man um, even when I was in high school man we were listening to uh, listen to Trick Daddy you know what I mean like yeah. early 2000s <laughs> listening to Trick Daddy yeah because yeah. I'm a thug all that <laughs> all that man all that all that man it was just like okay so this is how to get down man yeah, but um man. but yeah man. much love man to Miami so, yeah, that, you lived in Miami, mm -hmm. um, pretty much lived in the state of Florida for a good amount of your life, and then you up and go to Boston. So, what yeah. <laughs> what led to that move up to the Northeast? Talk to us about that. You know, basically, man, it was a football scholarship. So, I got a, I got a, small, uh, a small scholarship to play uh, junior college football at a small school called Dean College in Franklin, Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, they, they've since become a four-year institution but uh, in their football program. But, um, but uh, I got a small scholarship to go there, and I just took a chance and said, okay, I'm going to go. And one of my high school uh, teammates was going there as well, Quentin Chandler. He was a running back from high school. Mm -hmm. And so he went there. And, uh, and that wasn't odd to us. That's what I say about Miami teaching you lessons, right? It wasn't odd to, to leave the state and go play football somewhere else. You had plenty of people were doing that. So, um, so you know, I took the chance. I'd never been to Boston before. Massachusetts, never been in. And, um, and, and got out here and experienced the cold for the first time. The way that I can. <laughs> 17 degrees now, man. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I got there. And, and it was a great experience. One of the best decisions I made in my life. Um, um, and, and, and I still benefit being an alum from Dean College. And so that's how I got there, you know, that small football scholarship. And I went yeah. there and did my thing. And then, and then even yeah. after your post-football, you actually went back to Dean College and did some work for them as well. Like, you actually worked right. there for some time, yeah, right? So, right. So that's what happened. I went back, left Dean College, ended up uh, uh, finishing up at UCF. Uh, shout out to UCF Knights, man. Great time when I was there. Nice. And um, and then maybe a couple years after I graduated, like two years after I graduated, I was kind of looking for grad, you know, looking to get into grad school, trying to find some work. But once again, to to um, to to speak on what you mentioned earlier, you know, being a black man in Florida. And so, um, you know, it was a little bit of a struggle for me to find the type of work that I wanted. Um, it, it within education, so I I you know started looking out of state for for different jobs, and I got a six week position working at Dean College. Okay. And um and I got interviewed from Florida, and in about three or four days after the interview, you know I flew up to Massachusetts for a six week job, and I purchased a one way ticket. I said. When I get there, I just purchase the ticket when I get back, you know, the return ticket once I get, you know, ready to go. And I came up here for six weeks, man, and I was 14 years ago and never never went back, never moved back to Florida. So one thing led to another. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's what happened, man. You just knew, you just knew, you know what, 
I'm gonna be here for a minute. So that's just the hustle in you. That's just the hustler in you, right? Just okay. Yeah. I'm gonna you come know, up it, here. It, it's all about opportunity, man. Yeah. Like I say, I say this to people now. About every three years, I get this major opportunity that just comes my way, and um, uh, and I, you know, I decide to take it or not. And a lot of times that I've taken it, it's turned out to be uh, a great blessing in my life. So that's what it is, man. I almost left a couple of times, but you know, I figured God got a reason for me being here. Awesome. So you spent some time at um, Dean College, and then you ultimately end up at Regis College. Yeah. So how I get to to get that far? So um, yeah, work. That, so I end up at Regis uh, based off some work that I've done with. Um, in my, my doctoral studies, my dissertation research. So mm -hmm. at Regis, I am an admissions specialist and consultant and all that, however you wanna name it, uh, for their Regis Diverse Educators Program, which is a full tuition scholarship for students that want to work with underrepresented populations. Um, and that's, uh, it's based off some of the work that I've done or well, it's based off the research that I did for my dissertation, which was uh, effective strategies for recruiting um, African American males into the undergraduate education major, mm. and that was specific towards uh, Black men. And so we've expanded that um, with this initiative at Regis. So prior to that, um, I was working at Dean College. I did a lot of jobs there, RD, student activities, academic advisor. I was a professor there. Um, I went over to Foxborough Regional Charter School where I was a uh, tech specialist there. I was also teaching at UMass Boston in their Upper Bound program. Wow. And then, um, yeah, man, there's a lot in there. And then uh, way before the Regis stuff. And then, um, like I said, when I when I, I finished up my doctoral work, yeah. um, the, the Regis opportunities came up. And so I've been doing that initiative for about a year and a half. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not second cycle right now. And so uh, for those out there listening, our, our deadline is January 1st this year. So um, if you know any students that want to major in education, they can uh, look up on my website at regiscollege.edu in Massachusetts and apply to our Regis Diverse Educators Program because you know, we know that education is a great industry yes. um, and, and, and needs, um, we need to diversify that workforce, but also understanding that um, financial cost is a barrier for a lot of students to um, pursue their college dreams. And so we, we, we learned that um, in helping students uh, choose what they they want to do, especially and, and this is one of their dreams. We wanted to eliminate that financial barrier, or at least some of that financial barrier for them, and that's how we came up with this with this program. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. And um, that's as you're talking about just removing the financial barriers, it just makes me think about um, the recent public education forum that took place up in Pittsburgh uh, right. with the Democratic candidates mm -hmm. and. It's been amazing how we've had so many debates uh, mm -hmm. throughout this campaign, and it just seems like in every debate, you don't really hear a lot about education, or you don't hear about education at all, which is crazy to me. Because mm -hmm. I feel like, not to be partial, but it's such an important topic um, yeah. in our country. So right. um, as the candidates were talking, they were saying all the things that we want to hear. We want to mm -hmm. increase teacher pay. Mm -hmm. um, we want to try to erase all student debt. Well, that's more so Bernie Sanders and um, uh, Elizabeth Warren. And, and these are all things that we want to hear. We want to triple funding. This is Joe Biden saying we want to triple funding for Title I schools so mm -hmm. we can get more school psychologists and guidance counselors, you know, mm -hmm. into the schools. All right. great things. But um, mm -hmm. I always think how will these promises be delivered? Because we've, we've heard this in previous campaigns. Yeah. And when I think about the fact that it's still a struggle for many school districts, not even just Boston and the greater Boston area, but just other urban metropolitan areas to get more students of color to pursue a Korean education. Mm -hmm. Um. I just wonder, like, what 
what more can we do to to make that happen? How can we make that interesting? Because I mean, I know like I did the inspired um fellowship here in Massachusetts, right? Uh, through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and it right. was a, it's a nice initiative. It's a new initiative, and it's now in its second year. Yep. And it's definitely a step in the right direction, but right. there's still so much more that has to be done. So. Um, with the Regis Diverse Educators Program, well, first off, how long has it been in existence and, and how, how many students um, get admitted into the program every year? So what's that process like? Yeah, so, um, so we accept five students a year. We, okay. we, we have five full tuition scholarships a year. And uh, we've been in, like I said, this is our second cycle. So um, we, uh, this is our second year in. And um, we're 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 uh, looking at our second cohort right now, um, and in the process, you know, um, it's a merit-based scholarship, so students still have to be high achieving. So um, they have a three-five GPA, they have to write a three-to-five page essay, have a nomination, you know, um, nomination letter from uh, advisor, headmaster, somebody in their school, and then they go through a selection process. And to answer your question about, you know, what can we do to make it more attractive? Um, I'm glad you talked about that because it's one of the things that I do when I'm recruiting students. We have to change the perception of the education industry. Mm -hmm. And I say education industry because people don't think of it like that. Yeah. Um, you are a teacher, but you are also an author. You're also a, ho a, a, a host, you do workshops, you speak, you do all these other, other um, you do all these other things within, your, within edu the education space, right? Yeah. And too often, when we talk about diversifying the education industry, we talk about one occupation, which is the teacher. And I agree with that, I think we need that. But we also need to look at the entire industry. Okay, so I was a tech specialist in education, and when I worked at a charter school, I had an impact on students, um, the same, not primarily in the classroom, but just my presence in the school and the different clubs that I was able to advise, the mentor group that I started, um, different workshops that I would do on technology. I was able to impact students and, and um and help them explore other avenues within, you know, education and, and the occupations, right? So students didn't know you could be a network administrator at a for a school district or at a school. They didn't know you could be an accountant for a school district. I mean, I was sitting up in meetings, um, you know, discussing uh, four hundred thousand dollar contracts with Google, you know, for Google Chromebooks and things like that for the district. Mm -hmm. And a lot of students don't know that. Um, there's policy in education. There's law in education. There's uh, the superintendents. There's principals. There is transportation within education. Somebody has to figure out the bus routes. Somebody has to, uh, there's engineering in education. So somebody has to design the schools and the pathways and directions in which kids walk and enter the school. There's security within education. Education is an industry within itself. Yeah. And so when we talk to students about, the, about being an educator, we have to change the conversation to talk about the entire industry. You work at a school, you know what it's like to order paper towels and order wow. uh, utility, uh, 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 order, uh, order, uh, um, uh, what's the word I just to, to order materials from the outside that comes to school. You know, somebody delivers them to the school. There's an inventory sheet with that. Yep. There are purchase orders with all of that. So. You know, there are students that are interested in certain jobs, but they don't always apply it to the industry. So when a student tells me I want to be an accountant, I say to them, have you ever thought about being an accountant for a school district? Have you ever thought about being an accountant for a school? I want to be a lawyer. Have you ever thought about being a lawyer in education? Have you ever thought about changing policy in education? Things like that. Because all of that is within the industry. The, the, the discipline gap, the achievement gap, the homework gap, the tech gap, all of those things are impacted um, 
from the decisions made by people that occupy these spaces within the industry. So there's a superintendent that's making a decision on what books to bring into the classroom. Mm -hmm. There are people that are making decisions on what movies you can show. So when we look at our kids now and say, well, why are they, 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 they have that book? And why are they showing that movie? Because somebody's deciding that that needs to be in, in, the, in the curriculum. And if you have a problem with that, then you need to take that position and then you make the decisions that bring forth uh, 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 more cultural experiences or uh, have a more cultural impact on those students that, are, uh, that we are serving. So I think in order to uh, 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 bring students uh, to the table, let, let's say, in order to uh, uh, increase the interest of students wanting to work in the industry, we yeah. have to change how we talk about the industry. Um, and and um, all the the different uh, avenues you can you can all the different streams of income you can have as an educator that go beyond just your original position, um, and and I think we don't talk about that enough, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's the, the answer to some of your questions. About no, that. that's and I'm glad you mentioned that because I just feel like we have to redefine the way that we talk about education, as you already mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah, to redefine what it means to be an educator because for the longest time, the perception has been in order to be an educator, you have to be in the classroom, which is so right. far from the truth because you have people who run nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and they mentor students. They're educators right. in right. that sense. Right. You have coaches. You've had a lot of coaches throughout your athletic life. Right. They're educators on the, on the field. You right. know what I mean? So, we, we don't have to relegate education to the classroom. Right. You have to look at it in a more global perspective mm -hmm. so that people can see what that could look like. And, and I think not everybody can, not everybody's equipped to be a teacher in the classroom. Let's just be real. Right, exactly. That, and that's why you have high levels of teacher attrition in different mm -hmm. districts because they realize, you know what? Initially, I wanted to do this, but I realized maybe I'm not cut out for it. And mm -hmm. that's okay if you come to that realization. But right. that doesn't mean that you can't have an impact on children. As right. you've mentioned, there are other positions you can take to still right. support um, education systems in your community. And right. we need to highlight those so that we can bolster the interest in mm -hmm. our students, particularly at the high school level. Mm -hmm. You know, so because they just think, man, like, I don't want to teach, you know. Right. I don't really get a whole lot of money and all that. Mm -hmm. But we got to show them that it can be so much more attractive. I mean, when I was, um, when I was teaching, I was telling my kids, this is around the time when I did uh, my first book, Shape Teach Identity. Mm -hmm. Like, my kids saw me with my books. Right selling them to some of my coworkers. They're like, oh, Miss South Mensa, when am I going to get a copy? Right. And they started right. asking me questions about how I published the book. Right. How much was I making for the book? Right. Who decorated the cover of the book? So they started to be interested in the process mm -hmm. of, of, you know, me making the book. Right. And I'm a math teacher. Right. So, so it's like they were interested in that. And when they saw that, you know what, after school, I would go to these conferences to vend my book, but also to do workshops, they're like, right. oh, you travel again, Miss South Memsa? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and they, they were interested in, in hearing about my travels and, and all my different endeavors. Right. And mind you, I'm a math talk teacher. about that stuff. I'm a math we don't, teacher. Don't, right. We don't make our position attractive. Like I always oh. say, as educators, we don't floss enough. We don't. We don't floss. Yeah. And then we wonder why, kid, why kids don't want to be us. No, we don't floss. That's why I come through clean every day, man. Power suit, power top, there power you move. You know, you, 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 we, we got to want the kids. The kids have to want to be us. And we don't floss enough, man. We don't do that. But let's take it a step further. If you look on the internet, and you know this, man, because we're, we're kind of in the middle of this movement where you have a lot of educators, man, 
Mm -hmm. You have professors in universities, mm -hmm. public school teachers in mm -hmm. schools. Right. They're creating content right now. You see them doing YouTube videos. You see right. them with their own shows and podcasts. Right. You see them controlling their narrative and using right. their voice to impact change in their communities because they realize just being in the classroom is not enough. We need right. to find a way to extend our impact mm -hmm. um, beyond our schools so we can impact more families, more students, mm -hmm. and the greater right. community. And so right. you have this, you have this movement of content creation coming from the mouths of teachers. Right. Yeah. Especially in this era of social media. Like even now, like I'm doing a show, but like mm. I've done an online course. Right. I'm about to publish a second book and mm. contribute to a third one. Um right. and these are things that I just and I just caught wind of it later on in my career. There's some right. people who are already starting to do this and they're early in their careers as teachers. Right. I, I just started to figure that out in year eight. Right. Some people already figured it out in year one, year two. Some people are already doing it right now. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, there's one podcast that I've been um, a guest co-host for this past yeah, for, throughout this month yeah. called um, Future Educators Talk with Damien and Darren. And these yeah. brothers just got out of high school a year ago. Wow. And they are, and they aspire to be educators. Right. So they decide to do a podcast to talk about that. These are, oh, wow. these are 18, 19 year old young men. Yeah. Talking mm -hmm. about the aspirations, education, talking about right. issues that matter. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Education. Right. So, it's just amazing how, you know, we just have this influx of content being spewed out by educational experts, by the teachers. Right. We're not, we're not waiting for the webinars. We're not waiting for these right. big conferences that a lot of us really can't afford, you know, because you already know how these conferences are. You're paying yeah. 500 <laughs> $600 to just register. You right. still got to pay for airfare because more than likely it's out of state. Right. And then depending on what the conference is, you might have to pay for your own food if it's not included in the registration costs. Right. So, the hotel, everything, everything. Exactly. Else. So yeah. after maybe three, four days, you drop at least a thousand dollars on one conference. Right. Yeah. So we need alternatives. So here you go. Right. right. And I, 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 that's why I support the, the, the movements on social media, man. I try to support everybody. Uh, shout out to Teach, Hustle, Inspire, man. I try to, I try to support so many people. And um, I like what social media does for, um, for move, you know, for moving conversations forward yeah. and allowing people to showcase uh, their, their talents and other things that they have going on in their, in their lives as educators. So I really appreciate social media for that. Um, I know some people have their, their, their negative uh, perspective on social media, but I'm not that type of person. So yeah, man. Definitely. Yeah. But I think ultimately it's all about how you utilize your social media networks. Yeah. Definitely. If you use it for good, then, you know, positive outcomes will come out of it. That's just how mm -hmm. I look at it. Right. So it's definitely. all about how you use it. Right. But yeah. Um, so man, still a lot to talk about. Why don't mm -hmm. we um let's talk about Bristol Community College because I know you just got a new position there yeah. as a director of a trio. Yes. Um, out there. So can you just explain yeah. to the audience, you know, what does trio mean and what does All your right. new role entail? All right. So um, trio is a federally funded program, and it actually there's there's actually several trio programs, but it started out as three, and so you might hear of. Uh, upper bound or uh, upper bound veterans or um, that's a uh, trio McNair scholars or trio talent search or trio SSS. Okay. So each program works with a certain group of um, students. So let's say uh, upper bound will work with high school students and help and their role is to help them gain access to college trio SSS student support services 
is a program that works for students that are currently in college and students meet a certain criteria so a lot of the times they are low income first generation or have a documented disability and first generation um, here is defined as your parents your mother or father don't have a, a bachelor's degree in the u.s so and there's a lot that goes into um being a first gen student or a low income student so you know that's a conversation for another day just a lot that that students face when they go into college um, from those particular backgrounds so the trio program helps students um, navigate the college environment have access to college you know you provide college tours for them yeah. uh cultural events that they can't afford uh or uh, you know or can't afford the transportation to um you try to enrich them in that sense um you know provide speakers and lecturers for for students um and a lot of academic support so uh trio sss program may provide one-on-one -on -one advising for students at an institution that may have a walk-in advising center mm -hmm. so some you know a first generation student um that's going into a walk-in advising center in a year may see 10 different academic advisors but within a trio program they get assigned an advisor for the entire duration of their college uh, career so that may help the student out because they have one person that they're connecting to um, and then, you know, from a two years perspective that, you know, you want to take a group of students to a college fair or something along that line, but academic support, culture, exposure to cultural events, um, and, uh, and, and any other support that a student may need that's within those guidelines and, and that we are allowed to um, provide. So I was, um, I've always worked with special populations, whether it's been athletes or um, when I was mentoring a group of Haitian students. So, um, I moved into TRIO Student Support Services at my former institution, which was Massasoit Community College. So to help everybody out, I'm at, you know, uh, community college during the day, and then by evening and weekends, I'm working for Regis and I'm out there recruiting, right? So um, I was uh, uh, the director of TRIO SSS for two years, which I said is the program that focuses on students that are already at college or already mm -hmm. in college, at a college, however you want to put it. And then now I'm over at Bristol Community College where we have three TRIO programs within our department. So we have Talent Search, Upper Bound, and TRIO SSS. So I have three assistant directors and now I am the director of the TRIO, quote unquote, the, the TRIO department, so to speak. Um, so my role there is supporting my three assistant directors and um all their needs for their programs you know making sure we're in compliance with the federal guidelines um making sure that we are providing the support that the students need and then you know bringing you know being fresh eyes bringing in new ideas uh new ways of, of communicating with, with families and students um so that is a lot of um of what I do in that role as far as you know just supporting my staff supporting uh, um, the ways that we bring services to students and I love it because there's a lot of students out here that um, I always say this you know students want to go to college they have a desire to go but they don't always know how to go Mm -hmm. or they don't always have the resources to finish college and that is something a lot of people don't understand you know the desire is there um, um, the, the drive is there the, the discipline is there but if you cannot afford uh, books for school then you can have all the desire in the world um, but you can't afford the book so how can you finish a class that requires a hundred and thirty dollar book with a code in it that you have to then you can access you know your homework assignments if you can't afford that then you know you can have all the desire in the world man. so um, with these programs providing that academic support for students is really near and dear to my heart because like I say students want to go to college but they don't always know how Wow. and um, we help them how and there's a lot of students out there um and i'll plug this real quick i started changing a, a phrase that we use we often talk about at-risk students and um and i struggled with that phrase for a while mm -hmm. and so i'll come up with something new where uh we'll debut to now where i say you know there's a difference between an at-risk student and a student that is resource ready 
Wow. Yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, because uh, a, a student that, you know, is resource ready, they have all, they have the, the determination, the desire, all that, but they need some resources to get through um, this, this school semester or this, this, this major, however, wherever you, wherever you meet them in their college journey, they need certain resources. So I love being in a position where we can provide resources for students that are resource ready. Yeah, that's, and that's, um, that's interesting to me because I just think about my own journey in college and I came from a two parent household. Both my parents were college educated. My father, my father ended up getting an MBA from uh, West New England University. Uh, and my right. mom attended school at Westfield State College for nursing. Right. So right. growing up, uh, we all knew that college was going to be the next step after high school. We didn't have any right. exposure to apprenticeship programs or trade programs. We just knew, okay, once we finish college, once, once we finish high school, I'm sorry, we go to college. That was just right. our path that right. was given to us. And all throughout college, I was that student who always hit up financial services because I knew <laughs> I didn't have the money to register for a next class and I didn't want to get a hold because you know how it is. You get a hold of your account. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, the class that you need this semester that's probably only being offered that semester is now going to be offered just maybe once a year. And this is the only chance to get into that class. So you're going to do whatever you can to get into that class. So I used to be up on the phone with financial services and say, hey, you know what? I know I owe y'all money, but you know it's it's coming, and they'll right. and then you know they'll they and they work with me and they assure me that all right, we're gonna take the hold off of your account so you can register, but please make sure you get that payment in, right. you know, within the next couple of weeks. So you know they bent right. they they did bend the rules for me a little bit at Temple, um, mm -hmm. and I appreciate them for that because there were many semesters where. I probably should have been able to register for a class, but they saw my trials and they saw that my mom was trying and, you know, she was working at the time, maybe two, three jobs just to finance my education um, during undergrad. Right. So they recognized the struggle and they did what they mm -hmm. could on their end to try to make that process easier for me. So I definitely understand how that could be a, a struggle, you know, for mm -hmm. college students. Yeah. 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 But um, stay, staying on that, because you talked about student athletes and, you know, you yourself, you're a former student athlete. Um, right. so, so just share with us some of the work that you've done with student athletes, you know, in the different schools you've um, been employed in. So um, much of work um, with student athletes uh, was at at the at dean college when i was okay. working there for six years when i first came back um but and since then i have um i've either kept in touch with those students as they transfer to four-year institutions or they would give my name to a friend of theirs and uh, and then i would help them from there and then i did some work with um Later on in life, I did some work with uh, Strong Arm Athletics down in Miami, which is the um, the uh, athletic branch of Strong Arm Entertainment, mm -hmm. which is headed by um, Flo Rod, the rapper Flo Rida and Flo Rida, Freezy, yep. his manager. Yeah, so they all run our Strong Arm Athletics. So if you ever in Miami and you see Strong Arm Athletics somewhere, that's that program. And so I've done some work with them. Um, and really with, with, with the athletes, I've done a lot of academic support and helping them, you know, understand, you know, uh, eligibility, um, uh, study skills. And, and, and what I do is I help athletes transfer what they're doing in athletics into the classroom. So if you think about an athlete, you wake up in the morning in college, you, you got to hit the weight room. You know, you, so you're up earlier than everyone getting your body ready. All right, and then you go to film session. So you're studying plays. You um you you're doing repetition and practice over and over and over so that it uh, you develop muscle memory. Mm -hmm. um, when you play a football game, you usually have some kind of strategy and preparation 
before you play the game. Once you play the game or during the game, you might have adjustments that you're making every time you step off the field and then at halftime. Once the game is over, depending on how you performed in the game, you go back and you review the film with your coach. So, and then you always have these goals as well too, right? So, you know, after the season ends, your coach may say, you need to get stronger. You need to gain weight. You need to work on this. You need to work on that. And athletes do it. Mm -hmm. They do it. Um, after practice, you may need to go see the trainer to uh, work on your ankle because you have a sore ankle. You sprained your ankle a couple weeks ago, but you still get that treatment throughout the season. So when you think about that and athletes doing, move that into the classroom. So I tell athletes, do you wake up in the morning and study math before school? The same way you went into the weight room. Mm -hmm. Do you sit down with your professors and review the lessons uh, you have a class three days a week. Do you review those lessons with the professors the same way that you review your practice film every day with your coach? Do you make adjustments when you're uh, 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 taking notes or, or writing a paper? Do you make adjustments um, uh, on each page or on each topic the same way that you do on the field? When you take a test in, in the class, whether you do, uh, depending on how you do on it, do you go back and review the test the same with the professor the same way that you reviewed the film with your coach? Remember when I said you might have sprained your ankle in game three, but you, you still playing throughout the season, but every day after practice, you have to go see the trainer to get that work on your ankle done, right? So in a sense, that's like being in class, but also going to see the tutor every day after class, the same way you went and saw the trainer. So I, tr I get students, uh, uh, student athletes to take the skills that they're using on the field and just transfer them over to the classroom. Another example, um, you can ask a, uh, any athlete pretty much uh, some stats on their sport and they can probably spew those stats out pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. And then you get into the classroom and start asking them about stats and they draw a blank. But what they don't recognize is that you're doing stats every day. True. You know what the probability of a first down is on a Thursday night game versus the probability of a first down on a Sunday morning game for a particular team mm -hmm. because you studied them enough and now you understand the probability, predictability. You know the average of a, a, a third down efficiency. Those are all mathematical equations and terms that we use on the field, but we don't bring that into the classroom. Um, when you're an athlete and, and you, have, you, you, you don't understand your playbook, you ask your coach questions. So why are you sitting in the classroom and you don't understand things in a lesson, but you don't ask your professor questions? So a lot of the work that I do is, is helping students transfer those skills into the classroom and be confident about, um, about using those skills in the classroom. And then there's other things, you know, helping them with transcripts and if they transfer and, um, and you know, calculating their GPAs and, you know, taking winter courses and all that. And uh, there's differences in, you know, if you take a course at an outside course, if a school will transfer the credit in versus transfer the grade in, and there's things that athletes just don't, you know, they don't always know the ins and outs of that. So I, I've, I've been, um, you know, I've, I've done that at the school when I was an advisor for, for um, a football team. Yeah. And then that branched out into some of my own work that I was, um, that I was just kind of forced into because athletes would tell their friends about me and say, you know, you need to talk to this guy, you know, talk to Henry, he'll help you out. So, um, so that's, you know, the, I really work with athletes on the, the academic end of it. I feel we have a lot of uh, coaches out there, you know, on the field. And so I didn't need to be another football coach on the field per se. I wanted to, to be on the back end, you know, work with them academically. And yeah. so that's, um, that's the work that I do there. I think that's so valuable because I'm sure, as you already know, I think student athletes in general get a bad name for a lot of yeah. different reasons. And, I'm, yeah. and as you were talking, I just kept thinking to myself, these are all valid points that you're making. But I would think that time management is absolutely essential 
for the student athlete because I could mm-hmm. think back to when I was in college. I mean, I was in the same class mm-hmm. as, you know, students who are in the who are on the basketball team, football team, baseball mm-hmm. team, and they would have to travel out of state to mm-hmm. you know play against these other universities. Right. You know, and they also had study hall late at night because guess what? Right. They're spending all day practicing on the field and then, you know, they eat their dinner and then they go to study hall. And there's a lot of stories about study hall. You know, you right. hear the stories about the student athletes finding the tutor to, mm-hmm. you know, do their work for them, you right. know, for some other, for some, like a transactional type of relationship, whatever. And you hear all these different right. stories, but then, you, right. but then there's some student athletes that actually took the academics seriously and they follow the same tips that you're sharing right now. Mm-hmm. So I guess my question is, how can we make the college experience easier for the student athlete? Because the way it's structured, depending on what school you attend, mm-hmm. it can be difficult to do all these things you're mentioning right. and still have the energy and the time to give your all, not only on the football field, but also in the classroom. So it's just, yeah. I'm, I can't imagine it's pretty difficult to do. Right. Yeah, you know what, you, you, you have, well, you have to hire people that understand the student athlete experience and can right. advocate for the student. I'll give you an example of something that happened at an st- uh, institution I was at. Okay. So at, at one institution, we, I did a survey with uh, the football team on who had um, a digital device for academic purposes. Mm-hmm. So that didn't include a cell phone. Because, you know, yeah, you could do a lot of work on a cell phone, but eventually you're gonna have to get to some type of computer, uh, desktop or laptop uh, digital device, right? Okay. And we found out that 23% of the athletes had no digital device for academic purposes, right? Now, what the college knew was that they had a laptop checkout policy, right? Where you can go to the library, check out a laptop from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then you could turn it back in. And if you didn't turn it in, it was just a $75 fine that they would just put on your bill, right? Sounds reasonable. Sounds legit. You could go check out a laptop every single day. Sounds legit. Right. But see, me being a former athlete, I understand athletes. I can't get to the library at 7 a.m. Why? Because I'm in the weight room at 6.30. Right. Right. Now, not only can I not get there, if I do get there, I got this laptop. This is the first time I'm on this laptop since, you know, a, a, a week ago or last night or whatever. So I'm checking email, my bank account. I'm checking my social media five minutes before class starts. Now you have the microaggressions that go along that, that go along in the classroom where some professors may not want a student on a digital device while they're in class because they mm. feel that student's not paying attention. True. So I'm not even getting to use the, the, the laptop to my benefit now that I'm in the classroom. Granted, some students didn't even get to check the laptop out. Yep. Then I got to go to football practice from three to six. Yep. Then I get out of practice at six o'clock, I gotta go eat. I gotta get this laptop back to the library by seven o'clock. Now let's say if you didn't get a laptop, when are you gonna get one? When are you gonna use it? When you don't have it at night. So I, I gotta turn on the laptop at 7 p.m. Study hall is at eight o'clock. Mm-hmm. I never even got to use a laptop. But when you when you hire people that understand what an athlete is dealing with. You can come in and then advocate for those athletes. So what we did then, we were able to change that policy where students could check out that laptop overnight. Mm. And so when you talk about making it easier, you need people there that understand the the life of athletes and what they're dealing with um, to make change in an institution. And that's how you make it you know, a bit easier for them. And you, and you provide resources for them. So, you know, um, if professors have a uh, extra books and they can put books on loan in the library, then do it. You know, a lot of professors get several copies of their books or have extra copies of it. And, you know, they're just sitting in a room and they don't know that the students may need those books and things like that. So 
you know, you, 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 I would say, you know, definitely hiring people and, and looking at the policies and, and like I say, time management and how these things impact students. Um, you talked about traveling. I had a group of, you know, I had a, a team one time. They got back in from a game. It was, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Wow. And I had them for an 8 a.m. class, you know. And so I got students in class falling asleep. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, I understood that they had just gotten back from a game. Had I had I been another professor, you know, you there, there's all kind of things, you know, docking them for points and you know kicking them out of class. But what's the student going to do? That you know, they, they, they drop their tire. So you know, you have to have people in 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 your institution that understand those type of situations and um, and 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 can advocate for the students to look at the policies and. Um, and see what needs to be done at that institution. Now, the NCAA has uh, put forth some regulations on how much students can practice and, you know, what you can do with them depending on different semesters, and that helps. But, um, you know, colleges get around that, you know, and and still during the season, I mean, it's hard, man. You know, you're working 24-7 pretty much as an athlete, and then you're studying all the films and weightlifting and all that, your body's just tired. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have to have people that understand that and that can make those type of changes. No, no, absolutely. And I don't think there are enough advisors in these universities who have gone through the um, student athlete experience, mm-hmm. you know, who can, you know, really provide some perspective to those who have never been in, in that situation. Right. You know, we, we need more of that. But yeah. let's stay on this. Let's stay on this topic for a second because you mentioned the NCAA, and yeah. as you know, just recently um, they just put out, they just voted on some legislation that would allow athletes to financially benefit from you know their likeness and the use of their image and everything. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about those star athletes that we know of that may appear on video games or maybe those athletes who have their jerseys in the bookstores in these colleges and they're being sold to you know their peers right Mm -hmm. now which is something that personally i felt should have happened a long time ago because i mean we think about just the plethora of superstars that have gone through college and are now you know in the professional leagues i mean and they didn't get a single dime, but you have the universities profiting off of their backs. Um, mm-hmm. So, I, so I, I get it. But then on the flip side, that just seems to apply more to Division One single A schools. Mm-hmm. So, how do the other schools benefit, like the Division Two schools and the Division Three schools? Because when we talk about, you know, financial benefits and all these issues that usually applies to division one schools. And it's usually the top right. schools. Right. And then we talk about the players It's usually the top players who you, who you know are going to leave school early to, you know, go to the pros. So, right. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I, I, I you know, I struggle with this one a little bit, man, because, yeah. you know, when you think about, um, you know, tuition, right. So let's say, if, you know, you're sitting at, Sixty thousand dollars in tuition. Mm-hmm. Any student getting four years of, of of an education, you know, you're looking at twenty two hundred forty thousand dollars, right? And uh, you know, I, you know, off the of sixty. So I can understand people's argument that you know, oh, they're getting a free education. Um, but the, the what I think it you know historically, the colleges weren't making what they're making now. Okay. And I think when the revenue started to change, they needed to change the system to go with it. Yeah, and, that, and that's how it works in capitalism, right? Like, like the 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 salaries of the of of the top percent go up, but the salaries of those on the bottom don't go up, right? Yeah. So you know, so you have this gap. Um, I think at the at the at the universities weren't making at you know the billions that they're making then they they would have a better argument but i mean that the revenue changed to where it went you know from millions to to billions you know mm-hmm. but at the same time i understand what what 
I understand those that argue, you know, the student is getting education, they're flying here, they're flying there, they're getting meals, they're getting, you know, top notch weight room. Um, there's, there's all kind of perks to being an athlete. But what I also think is that they can figure it out. I don't think everything needs to come in the form of a check or complete monetary compensation. True. Um, there, there, there needs to be, you know, if, if there needs to be some type of system. You know, they can increase the stipends. They can um, have some kind of credit-based system where, you know, as you're playing these, these, these if you, as you're playing these years for the college, you, you create some kind of uh, – you build some kind of credit towards a master's degree or something like that. <laughs> I, I, I believe we're smart enough to figure it out because you're right. When you look at the top schools, the power schools, what they'll be able to do versus the division twos and the division three schools is, is you know, it's very different. Um, so, so it won't be even across the board. And then you create um, this, this competition, so to speak, which is already there in a sense. Um, that may be unfair in some ways, but I th I think we need to figure something out where it may not be monetary. Sure. But it, but it, it but there needs to be a benefit in there when you look at what the schools are making the the the, the revenue now. You know, and now you got the ESPN. You know, you you always had the contracts, but I mean, just the the level of the ESPN contracts. The TV now, revenue is crazy. Right, you know what they're being, what they're doing, um, what what schools are receiving to go to bowl games and this and that. A, a quick situation to, to look at: um, Zion Williamson this year. If mm -hmm. you look at what he did at Duke, yeah, and the way the ticket sales increased when when he was there. I, I mean, you can't look at that and say, "Well, you know, he's getting an education." Yeah, but you know, those tickets were thousands of dollars, you know, for him being there, right? The other situation I will I will look at is uh, a couple years ago with Kevin Ware. He was the uh, the basketball player for um, that broke his leg in the game. Louisville, I right? I think yeah, the one from Louisville. And then they had the shirts that uh, they made up. Yeah. The Adidas made the shirt and and started selling shirts and and they're profiting off this man breaking his leg. Breaking you know? a leg, you're right. Right. So I remember that situation very well. And those are the type of situations where. When I see them, I say, okay, we need to work out something because they clearly, you know, started profiting off of his injury and his name and his brand in a, in a sense. So um, so you, you can't turn a blind eye to something like that. You can't turn a blind eye to Zion Williamson's shoe comes apart and Nike stock dropped. Mm -hmm. So you know that there's a correlation here, right? So I, I, I can't say that I have the answer. What I will say is that I think we can figure something out. And, and instead of arguing about it, it's accept the truth that we are making money off of these kids. Right. You know, um, when, a, when, a, when a school, and I, I can point this out through my research, when a school wins a championship, college applications increase by 12%. Mm hmm. OK, yeah. so, so so you got to think about that. You know, um, you, you're from Mass. You, you've been in Massachusetts. You knew about Doug Flutie and Boston College and the Hail Mary. Sure do. You know, you, you, you know about that. And, yeah. and that happened long before you got here. But but if you go back to that year when that happened and that, the way the applications increased after that. So I there's you can't deny that these athletes are providing all kind of promotion for the schools, free marketing, free promotion, and, um, and the revenue that the schools are making off of these students, um, that something needs to be done. And I believe that we are smart enough to get in a room and figure it out, whether it's credit-based, um, some type of stipend where your, your family can travel. Cause what's going on with some of these athletes now, you look at, uh, uh, Chase Young from uh, Ohio State, the kid, the, the kid from Ohio State yeah. that um, that was suspended for four games because you know he wanted his girlfriend to come see him play in the Rose Bowl, and so we couldn't provide some kind of travel stipend for him and his family and things like that. Nothing could be provided for him. 
I think we need to get in the room and figure out the best way to do this and um and 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 change it from what it is now because it's it's clearly not it's it's working it, it it's working and the benefit for the school is far more than the benefit for the student right and um just another story you know another recent story james wiseman the the, the basketball the player in Memphis. Yeah. Just I just found out recently that he's now going to declare for the NBA draft. And he's currently, I think, suspended. Yeah. Because uh, over a year ago, he received money from his coach, Penny Hardaway, yeah. to, Ooh, um, yeah. I think, move to a new spot, you know, with his yeah. mom. And this is well right. before Penny Hardaway got the job in Memphis. So this is just a coincidence. But the NCAA right. is looking at it as, you know what? That's a bribe. You can't take right. money, you know, right. from, from, you know, a coach of this institution you're in. But he wasn't the coach at the time. This was, right. this was Penny Hardaway, who is from Memphis, helping right. out a young brother who's trying to move into a new place with his mother. Right. That was just him I, doing a good deed. And look at how it turned out. Right, and you, and you and he is going to the league. You think about that situation. Yeah. Um, I don't know all the details of it, but here's this kid that has to give up his education because of what he's going through. He right. said, I got to let it go, you know, because if he get hurt or anything, he's going to lose out on millions. So in a sense with him, he almost is forced to go to the NBA right now, how I see it, because if look at what all he went through now just in his freshman year. You know, and so, and now, if we really, if we want to get deeper into this, and some, you know, you look at the coaches that uh, went through some of these scandals that recently happened, um, with Adidas <laughs> and 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 things that they were offering, and a lot of them didn't lose their jobs. No, no, so, not at all. It, right. So it's interesting that the athletes have been suspended or faced all these suspensions, but when it comes to some of the things that the coaches have done. Um, um, they don't face the same uh, consequences as uh, as the players do, or the immediate, you know, so immediately as the as the the players do. So I think they need to get in the room and do something to fix it. Yeah. I, I think I think the reason why is because unlike professional sports, at with college athletics, mm -hmm. the coaches, especially in a major in a major um sports are the face of the programs. Think about Duke, mm -hmm. it's Coach mm -hmm. Mike Krzyzewski. Think yeah. about North Carolina, it's Roy Williams. Right. For many years, Florida State, the Seminoles, it was Bobby yeah. Bowden with the football program. Right. It's right. The, the coaches are the face right. of those, of those um, university programs. Whereas in you know, professional sports, it's the players, it's the right. The players are the ones that generate the interest. Right. right. You know what I mean? Right. So I think that's why coaches get a lot more cover than players mm -hmm. because guess what? The coaches are the face of the franchise. Imagine if Mike Kuszewski was in a scandal at Duke University. Just imagine that. Right. The amount of cover you have to do to protect this man because this man is, has a lifetime contract with the university. Right. The basketball course named after him. Right. Right. You see what <laughs> yeah. I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. So they're gonna protect the investment. They're gonna protect, they're gonna protect the coaches. First I and foremost. You. Yeah. But um, you know, yeah. time time is winding down. And um just wanna ask a couple more questions. I got you, Mike. So I mean, you are the ultimate hustler. You stay traveling to different conferences. I see you yeah. everywhere. Now, um, just for the audience, are there any special projects you're currently doing that are coming up? Like, what's what's um, you know, on the horizon for um, Doctor D. T. Henry? Talk. Yeah, to definitely, us. man. Always. Well, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to finish up. Well, I'm trying to finish one book and trying to uh, start another. And so the first one, like I said, I've, I've worked with athletes for some years and I, I still get questions about that. So I'm trying to finish up this book, man, on how to send your son to college on a football scholarship. And mm. it's really, you know, 
eight to 10 questions that I've been asked um, by parents and uh, middle school, high school athletes. And it's written for that audience. Um, just on, you know, how to get started, how to get recruited, how to utilize social media. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working on, I'm finalizing that. You know, I've been writing it for a while. Um, so I'm finishing that up and hopefully that'll be out, you know, early next year. And, um, and you know, short little manual, little guide for, you know, athletes, you know, middle school on up, you know, that, that are trying to, you know, get a football scholarship or some type of financial support while they play uh, a sport in college. And it'll also be for junior college transfers as well. And then the other book that I'm trying to work on is, uh, and I'm, I'm going back and forth through titles and it's to talk about um, being from Miami to PhD or from Miami to my doctorate. And uh, several, several lessons that I learned from the Miami streets that um, really motivated me through my, um, my doctoral journey. Yeah. Um, one of my, um, one of the songs on my playlist was Rick Ross, Every Day I'm Hustling. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, man. And, and you know, when, when you're writing a dissertation or, you know, even before that, when you're just going through that doctor journey, um, it takes some motivation. And, yeah. and, and, and um, it, you know, it, it, not to get so deep into it, but it takes, it takes a lot to, to get through it. Um, because, you know, it's up and down, man, you know, and so, um, but there were things that I, I drew on from my Miami years that really helped me get through. And I would post things up around my apartment, um, that, you know, different mantras that kept me going. Um, so that's something else that I'm doing for those that know me as a speaker, uh, come spring, I'm trying to speak to some football teams and, uh, do some study skills workshops with different football programs. So if you're out there, you want me to come talk to your football team and do some, uh, some academic work with them, I can do that. And, you know, um, work, you know, I got my new job at Bristol, so I got my work ahead of me. So we're working on a grant right now. We're in the grant writing year for uh, Trio SSS, it's the competition year. So I'm working on writing this grant. And uh, like I say, the two books, continuing with the podcast, speaking to some football teams. And then uh, come the end of spring, I'll be doing some commencement speeches. I love, you know, to inspire students that, you know, that are, are, have reached their, their high school graduation. And, you know, um, I think, you know, it's, it, we don't always uh, uh, tell, tell kids how great they are. Like, you know, as a, as a professor, I've been influenced by my students um, in the use of different digital platforms, let's say that. Wow. Uh, because I, I was sitting in the class one day and I told my students, this was a couple years ago, uh, Take it, take, uh, write down everything I wrote on a board, and they all pulled out their phones and took a picture. <laughs> yeah, from right. there, man, I just, I just started using that. Take a picture of this, take a picture of that, take a picture of this. And you know, I help students now, you know, uh, create a folder on their in their album, in their photos, and so they just dump stuff in the in that in that album folder, you know. So, um, so I, you know, I, um, I love talking to students that, you know, when they, when they reach the end of one journey and they're starting another. So I'll be doing some commencement speeches um, in the, um, in the spring. So, a couple like, of things on the plane, man. Right? There you have it, y'all. I mean, look at this guy. This guy is doing commencement speeches. He's talking to football players. He's writing books. Man, you, you just like a renaissance man. Like, <laughs> clearly. And the, the podcast still is jumping, man. You and know, then swag, swag bender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm still jumping that, man. So, yeah. Oh, man, I, man, I couldn't be more proud, man. Thank I couldn't you, be man. more honored to just, you know what I'm saying, to know you and to, to be in your presence right now. Um, and just, a, just to put another plug in for you, for those who are linked in, for those who are doing doctoral um, programs and are in that journey, this man published an article on LinkedIn about steps you should take while you're doing your doctoral um, program. Steps yes. you can take to get through it. It's yeah. on LinkedIn. Check yeah. this man's profile. And you could go right to the link. There's a link for that article. And it's very straightforward. I think it's three steps, but they are yeah. very helpful. Yeah, and I've actually tips. had a chance to read through it. So right. I'm trying yeah. to draw some inspiration yeah. from that. But right. um. Before we sign off, um, DT, let them know 
how they can connect with you on social media, you know, share mm-hmm. your website, all the information you need to know because people need to know what you're doing, man. So please share that information with right. us. If you, you want to connect with me, basically, you can just do Dariel D.T. Henry. That's D-A-R. I E L D T Henry. So everything is pretty much that. My Twitter is at Dariel D T Henry. Um, my Instagram is Dariel D T Henry. And if you just want to go to a central place and go from there, my website is Dariel D T Henry dot com. Um, same thing on my Facebook. You can just Google it and you'll find me in all of those spaces um, under Dariel D T Henry or Doctor Dariel D T Henry somewhere. Um, and so I got Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, business page on Facebook, personal page on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. I try to, you know, let people know the behind the scenes of my life and, you know, things that are going on in my life. I just try to inspire and motivate everyone. So you can find me in those spaces. Um, And then, you know, like you say, LinkedIn, I'm also on LinkedIn. So I'm on all the platforms. And, and then just, um, and then one more time for any high school found um college students who want to get into education please consider yeah. the regis college uh diverse educators program yes full tuition scholarships if you're trying to get yeah. into this education field mm-hmm. and you get all the support in the world from this man and others up at regis college so please consider that if you're trying to get into education right. and then um also Swagbender Podcast. I've been a guest yeah. on there. If you're yeah. interested in sharing your story and some of the great work you're doing in your community, mm-hmm. please holler this man. He's always looking for guests. So yeah. definitely check him out. It's a great podcast. Um, right. I've listened to it and it, the conversations are always rich and um right. insightful. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So um there you have it, people. You no, know, this is episode four. And we are thankful to have your time today. And wherever you are in the world, I just wish you a great day. And let's keep on inspiring these students. So on behalf of Dr. Daryl T. T. Henry, we are going to see you another time. Peace. God bless y'all. Peace in.